The recording for this meeting has begun. So I see a lot of familiar names today, but for those of you that are not familiar with the Housing Assistance Council, HAC is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that assists local organizations with building affordable homes in rural America. With the mission to improve housing conditions for the rural poor, HAC places an emphasis on striving to serve the poorest of the poor in the most rural places. HAC also emphasizes local solutions, empowerment of the poor, reduced dependency, and self-help strategies. HAC assists with the development of both single and multifamily homes and promotes home ownership for low-income rural families through a self-help sweat equity construction method. Interested in learning more about HAC services or products? HAC has an office near you. If you have questions or require assistance, please contact your nearest HAC regional offices that are being displayed on your screen. We can come back to this slide later on or at the end of the presentation, but just a quick look at where the HAC offices are located. Also, please mark your calendar and join us for the upcoming training. Nonprofit board membership on July 16th. Uh, Canal Street Housing, Housing Homeless Veterans on July 23rd. Nonprofit strategic planning on July 30th. Acquisition rehab for rural nonprofit housing development. That's actually taking place in New Orleans, Louisiana on August 12th through 14th, as well as sharpening your skills, financial management for nonprofit, also in New Orleans, Louisiana, August 12th through 13th. If you'd like to register for either one of the webinars or training, please register online. HAC's website is listed below, or if you have any issues with registering online, you can contact me directly. My contact information is listed below as well. All right, so before we get started, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Eric Orbedorfer. Eric is a research associate at the Housing Assistance Council in Washington, D.C. He has worked on a variety of products and reports that have focused on topics ranging from farm worker housing to homelessness on Native American lands, and most recently, housing for rural seniors. His previous experience includes working with affordable housing at the Department of Neighborhoods in Anchorage, Alaska, as well as the City of Vancouver and British Columbia Housing in Vancouver, British Columbia. He has published reports funded through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as the British Columbia Ministry of Housing and Social Development. So at this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Eric. Great. Thanks so much, Shantaria. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Eric Oberdorfer, and I'm a research associate here at the Housing Assistance Council. I just want to give a big thank you to everyone today for attending the webinar uh, from Service to Shelter Housing Veterans in Rural America. And the webinar today will examine some of the demographic, economic, and housing conditions of rural veterans. All of the information that's presented today in this webinar stems from HAC's most recently released report, also titled From Service to Shelter, which was made possible through generous funding from the Home Depot Foundation. The report is available to download for free online, and at the end of the session today, we'll provide you with a link to that. But before we get started with the webinar, I'd like to get a sense of what each of you in the audience today feels the biggest challenge for housing veterans in rural America will be in the coming years based upon your experiences and your um, <clears throat> work. So we're going to start with a poll. We have five options for what we think the biggest challenges might be. And these are, one, the changing demographics of rural veterans, two, meeting the needs of returning veterans as conflicts overseas end, Three, ensuring veterans receive supports they need in rural areas where delivery may be more complicated. Four, the lack of economic opportunities for veterans in rural areas. And five, addressing rural veteran homelessness. So a poll will pop up, and I want each of you to just take a couple seconds to think this question over and select which answer you think uh, will be the biggest challenge.
All right, great. It looks like everyone has put their answers in. And it seems we have a pretty strong majority leaning towards ensuring veterans receive supports that they need uh, that may be more complicated to deliver in rural areas, uh, followed by 38.4% with the lack of economic opportunities for veterans in rural areas. So I appreciate you guys all taking the time to think about this question and enter your responses. And I want you to keep these answers in mind as we go through this presentation today. Because at the end of this, I'm going to ask this question again. And I'd like to see if there's any variation that occurs if any of these answers change uh, based upon the information presented today. And if so, why that happened. Uh, maybe to open up for discussion why we think um, our initial thoughts might have, have changed. So to begin, veterans are more prevalent in rural America. Within the nation overall, just 9.6% of the population can claim veteran status. But when we look at veterans by location, we see differences. As you can tell from this chart, 11.4% of all rural and small town individuals are veterans, compared to just 10.4% of individuals within suburban and exurban areas, and 7.2% of individuals in urban areas. And here we can see that data represented geographically. The areas that have darker blue or red are counties that have higher percentages of veterans than elsewhere. And if you look at this map, you can see areas that are predominantly rural, especially in the upper northwest, um, northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, Maine, Nevada, Arizona, and the Florida panhandle up there. You can see these really high percentages of veterans within those counties. Veterans from the Vietnam War comprise a plurality of veterans within rural America at 36.5%. That's more than those who served during the first Gulf War and during Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Veterans who served during the first Gulf War and during Iraq and Afghanistan in rural America comprise 20.2% of all veterans therein. Now the numbers from those who served during Iraq and Afghanistan will grow as those wars wind down and individuals end their active service. But even though those numbers will increase, the percentage of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans will never be quite as large as the number of Vietnam veterans that exist in rural America today. But if we look at this infographic presented on this slide, we start to see a trend. We can see two distinct veteran age cohorts that are highlighted by the blue and the red soldiers. And these two age cohorts, cohorts are highlighted again here in this next uh, chart. And you can see the blue representing younger veterans or those between the ages of 18 and 54, and red representing older veterans, those 55 and older. And as you can tell, rural veterans are older. In fact, the median age for a veteran in rural America is 62 compared to just 40 nationally. Just 6% of veterans in rural America are between the ages of 18 and 34. The older veterans represented in red make up 70% of the overall rural veteran population compared to just 30% of those between the ages of 18 and 54. So as you can tell, these are two very different groups. Uh, based upon age, but even when we look deeper into these groups, we'll see differences that exist beyond just age. Younger veterans are much more diverse than their older counterparts. 21% of veterans within rural America between the ages of 20 to 34 identify as a racial or ethnic minority compared to just 6% of the veteran population over the age of 65. Younger veterans are actually much more in line with rural America overall, where 18% of the rural population identifies as either a racial or ethnic minority. Looking at veterans by gender and age, we also see some differences. If you notice, for veterans in rural America between the ages of 18 and 34, 17% are female. 
Yet overall, just 5.8% of the rural veteran population are females. This is mostly attributed to the small amount of female veterans over the age of 55 in rural America. So we can see that veterans between the ages of 55 and 74, just 3% are females, as well as veterans over the age of 75. And because older veterans comprise such a large group, these numbers impact the overall number of female veterans within rural America. The imbalance that exists for older veterans is most likely attributed to past recruitment and service policies that existed. So as a result, the number of female veterans will grow over time as those recruitment and service policies become further and further in the past. And this will have implications for VA outreach efforts and the types of services that are provided by VA medical centers. Younger veterans also face different economic challenges than their older counterparts. Overall, just 5.4% of rural veterans are unemployed. However, when we look specifically at veterans between the ages of 18 and 34 in rural America, we see that 10% are unemployed. Now, this trend holds over across the country. It's true for both suburban and exurban areas, as well as urban areas. Although you can see within suburban areas, there is a lower level of unemployment for for younger veterans. But even if we look deeper into the veterans between the ages of 18 and 34 within rural America, we start to see variation in their employment levels as well. So 18% of veterans between the ages of 20 and 24 are unemployed, compared to 11.8% of veterans between the ages of 25 to 29, and 8.4% of veterans between the ages of 30 to 34. A part of the reason why veterans between the ages of 20 to 24 have such high levels of unemployment partially has to do with the recession, which has made it more difficult for younger populations to enter the labor force, but also due to the fact that veterans between the ages of 20 to 24 are more likely to have just recently ended their active service, meaning that they are entering the labor force for the first time since leaving the military. Age also impacts the likelihood that veterans will experience poverty. 12% of veterans within rural America between the ages of 20 to 34 have incomes that fall below the poverty line, compared to 9.4% of veterans between the ages of 35 to 54 in rural America, 6.6% of veterans between the ages of 55 to 64 in rural America, and 5.7% of veterans aged 65 and older in rural America. That said, rural veterans are less likely than the rural population overall to experience poverty and have incomes that fall below the poverty line. Just 7% of all veterans within rural America have incomes that fall below the poverty line, compared to 16.3% of rural America overall. Overall, veterans have high quality housing in rural America. However, 23% have inadequate housing, meaning that they have one or more of the following housing problems. Either housing cost burden, which means that they're spending 30% or more of their income on housing, an incomplete kitchen, incomplete plumbing, or they live in crowded conditions, meaning that there are more than one individuals per room within the house. Typically, rural veterans with inadequate housing are cost burden. Rural veteran renters are more likely to be housing cost burden than rural veteran homeowners. 38% of rural veteran renters are cost burden compared to 19% of rural veteran homeowners. That said, 83.1% of rural veterans own their own homes. And again, rural veterans experience less housing cost burden than the rural population overall where 46.2% of all renters in rural America experience housing cost burden, and 19% of all homeowners in rural America experience housing cost burden. All right, so that was a, a brief overview of the first section of our report, which covers the demographics, economics, and housing conditions of rural veterans. And I know that that was a lot of data, and those were a lot of numbers to, to mull over. So I thought at this point in the presentation, we could stop for a second and take a quick little break to play a little bit of state trivia before moving on to the second portion of today's presentation, 
which will focus on veteran, veteran housing issues. So I have a couple questions that I'm going to ask before we, before we jump into that. So the first question I want to ask is, what state do you think has the highest number of rural and small town veterans? So what state overall has the highest number of rural and small town veterans? I'll give you guys a couple seconds to, to think that over. It uh, looks like we've got some guesses coming in. We've got Texas, Montana, Iowa, Nevada, Georgia, Michigan, South Dakota, Mississippi, Maine. Got North Carolina in there. All right, so let's see. So the states with the most veterans within rural and small town areas. At number five, we have Ohio with 214,609 veterans. Coming in at number four, we have Pennsylvania with 223,544 veterans in rural and small town areas. At number three, we have California with 233,947 veterans in rural and small town areas. At number two, North Carolina with 247,757 veterans in rural and small town areas. And the state with the most veterans in rural and small town areas is, as a lot of you guessed, Texas with 338,016 veterans. So now let's think about which state might have the highest percentage of rural and small town veterans overall. So we're not talking about the absolute number, but rather what state has the most per capita within. So give you guys a couple seconds to think this one through too. Like we've got some guesses here in Nevada, Oregon, North Carolina, Ohio, Alaska, Michigan, Kansas. So let's see. So moving on to our answer. The state that comes in at number five is Delaware with 13.9%. At number four, we have Florida at 14.01%. Coming in at number three is Arizona at 14.4%. Number two, we have Oregon with 14.8%. And the state with the highest percentage of veterans in rural and small town areas is Nevada with 15.6%. So we had a couple of Nevada guesses out there. Good job. All right. So we can see going back to this map that we looked at before, how this kind of pans out. And so when we look at Oregon and Delaware here, we see that there's a lot of red represented. Same with this area of Arizona off to the side, um, to the western part of the state, and, as well as northern Florida. <clears throat> so again, just presenting that information geographically, we can see how that pans out. All right, jumping back into it, we're now going to move on to the second session of the presentation today 
which is going to focus on veteran housing issues within rural America. And we'll start by talking about rural veteran homelessness. So as I mentioned before, although 9.6% of the nation overall can claim veteran status, according to nationwide point-in-time counts, 13% of the homeless population are veterans meaning that they are overrepresented within this population. And it should be noted that, yes, there are more homeless veterans within urban areas by numbers alone, but veterans typically make up a greater percentage of the homeless population within rural America. And in fact, in 2011, the annual Homeless Assessment Report to Congress found that in predominantly rural states like Kansas and West Virginia, this was true. And in fact, Kansas, within their homeless population, 33% of the homeless population within Kansas were veteran status, and 25% of the homeless population within West Virginia were veterans. And again, as I mentioned, this is noteworthy due to the predominantly rural nature of these states. So you can see how that is significantly higher than the 13% uh, national veteran homeless population, or the, the percentage of the homeless population that is veteran. So one of the programs that's been very instrumental in helping address this issue recently has been the HUD-VASH program. And for those who are unfamiliar with the program, HUD-VASH combines HUD rental assistance vouchers with case management and clinical services provided by the VA. It's been a very successful program, and in fact, it is actually credited in lowering the homeless veteran population by 17.2% since 2009. And actually, since our report uh, from Service to Shelter has come out, this number has been updated. And at this point, it's closer to 24%. So that's a huge amount of uh, the veteran homeless population that they have been able to serve through this program. Although it's been very successful, though, there are some barriers that exist to its use in rural America. And one of the biggest bar barriers lies in the fact that to be eligible for this program, a veteran needs to be within relative distance to a VA facility. And the reason behind that is since case management is such an important aspect to the HUD-VASH program, veterans need to be able to access their case managers often so that they see the effects of the program that um, will help them be permanently housed. However, within rural America, the average distance to a VA facility for a veteran is 24 miles. For someone who is at risk of homelessness or facing homelessness, that can be a considerable distance to have to travel. So it can be very hard, especially for remote rural residents or even further away from that, to access this funding. Beyond that, for veterans who live in remote rural areas who wish to move closer to VA facilities, moving costs are often prohibitive or even beyond that, a lot of these individuals don't necessarily want to move closer to a VA facility for a variety of reasons. They've chosen where they live, they live where they want to. So that can be hard in using this program in rural areas. And although rural America has more veterans per capita, as I mentioned, and 36% of all veterans that are enrolled within VA health systems live in rural areas, just 3% of HUD-VASH vouchers are allocated to VA medical centers in rural America. So that's a very small number compared to the population that is there. And beyond that, there are also restrictions to HUD-VASH on tribal lands, which are typically within rural areas. So tribes are not actually eligible for HUD-VASH funding. And this stems from the Indian Housing Block Grant Program that came about through NAHASDA, which is the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act. So NAHASDA prohibits targeted federal housing funds from use on reservations to promote increased self-determination. In certain cases, a tribe can consent to lease an eligible housing unit on their tribal land to be used for HUD-VASH, but this isn't something that's permitted in every state, and it varies depending upon where you are. This can be problematic as residents of tribal communities are more likely than the rest of rural America to live in substandard housing and Native Americans are typically overrepresented in the overall homeless population. So an interesting number is that overall, Native Americans represent less than 1% of the total population of veterans, but they account for 2.5% of all veterans experiencing homelessness. 
So there's an obvious overrepresentation of the Native American population within that group. Yet those living on tribal lands are not eligible to access HUD-VASH funding in most instances. The barriers that, to HUD-VASH in rural areas also highlight some of the challenges that exist to serving rural homeless veterans in general. So first of all, in rural areas, homeless individuals, whether they're veterans or not, are less likely to experience literal homeless, homelessness. Rural individuals are less likely to live on the street or in a shelter. Rather, they're more likely to experience precarious housing situations, moving from one extremely substandard, overcrowded, and or cost burden housing situation to another, often doubling or tripling up with their friends. Now, strong kinship networks within rural areas partially play a role in this, but even more importantly, this often happens because there are fewer shelters and homeless service providers within rural America. So there are less places for rural homeless to turn to. This also makes it very challenging to enumerate the homeless population within rural areas as most point-in-time counts are done through shelters and other homeless service providers. Substandard housing in rural America also plays an important role because unlike suburban or urban areas, rural areas often do not have building condemnation processes, meaning individuals who would be considered homeless in urban or suburban areas by living in a building that's deemed unsuitable for human habitation are not always considered homeless in rural areas, even if the homes are equally substandard. And this is important to note, as rural renters are actually twice as likely to live in substandard housing than their urban counterparts. Now, there are programs that exist beyond HUD-VASH to help homeless veterans. One of these is the VA Grant and Per Diem Program, or the GPD Program. The GPD Program helps organizations that focus on homeless prevention, rapid rehousing, and transitioning in place for veterans. Only programs with supportive housing up to 24 months or service centers are eligible. And by service centers, I mean a center that offers case management, education, crisis intervention, counseling, services targeted to homeless veterans, et cetera. The GPD program does not require specialized case management like the HUD-VASH program. And it operates through a transition in place model. So the program prepares veterans to achieve permanent housing through, initial, through the initial supportive period. And then once that's happened, the veteran is required to assume the lease at the end of the program. Ideally, that is 6 to 12 months after it begins, but it can go up to 24 months. In 2014, funding for the GPD program was at $250 million, which is actually up 15 million from 2013 funding levels, which is a good thing. And there is a push to try to increase the use of this within rural areas. Another program is the Supportive Services for Veterans Families Program, or SSVF. The VA awards grants to organizations that can provide supportive services to low-income families living in or transitioning to permanent housing. Families are provided outreach, case management, and assistance accessing VA benefits. Grants can also help families stay in their homes through time-limited payments. SSVF focuses on homeless prevention and rapid rehousing. Homeless prevention is intended for eligible families who are immediately at risk of becoming literally homeless, if not for SSVF funds. And rapid rehousing is intended for families who are literally homeless, as is. Now, the VA emphasis on literal homelessness adds complications to this program within rural areas because as I mentioned, most families experience homelessness through precarious housing situations or doubling up with friends and family. So the way the program is written now, these individuals would not be eligible for SSVF funding. Veteran seniors in rural America will also be a big, will also place a big impact on housing within rural America. Beyond that, it will place strains on elderly care and supportive services for seniors as well. Because as I mentioned, in the next 10 years, 70% of veterans in rural America will be over the age of 65. That is a significant number, and that will bring new housing challenges to those populations. 
Most seniors desire to age in place or live independently in their homes for as long as possible, and the same is true for veterans. But this can be harder in rural areas where spread out geographies make accessing services difficult. Also, as I mentioned before, many seniors own their own homes, or many senior veterans own their own homes, and they become more inaccessible as they age and will require modifications so that they can remain therein. So as a result, housing accessibility for veterans is really critical. And it's not only just critical for senior veterans, but it's also critical for veterans with service-related disabilities. Luckily, there are home modification pro or uh, there are, I'm sorry, a home modifications can significantly help veterans remain within their homes for much longer than if they were not able to access those modifications. And these can be very small from uh, different things that help with bathing, using the stairs, ramps to enter and exit homes, removing stairs, lowering um, countertops, and, and other little things that can significantly help a veteran perform their daily requirements. But luckily, there are federal grants that assist with modifications. So the VA Special Home Adaptation Grants are for veterans that have experienced less severe combat-related injuries. And these grants are available for up to approximately $13,000. The VA Specially Adaptive Housing Grants are also available for veterans, but those who have severe combat-related injuries. And these grants are available to up to approximately $65,000. The Temporary Residence Assistance Grant is for veterans who have received either SHA or SAH grants, and that helps their family adapt their home so that the veteran can live with family members while, their, while SHA or SAH construction is completed. So these are, are small things, temporary ramps and other things, just to make it so a family member's home is accessible for the veteran while they're waiting for construction on their own home to be completed. VA Home Improvements and Structural Alteration Grants, HISA grants, are also available. These are up to $6,800, and these are available to all veterans who need home modifications, regardless of whether their injuries are service-related or not. So this could be used by senior veterans uh, who might need home modifications due to old age, or veterans who maybe have um, had injuries since returning for, from service. Lastly, there's also the USDA Section 504, Very Low Income Repairs, Loans and Grants Program. Uh, 504, it should be noted, is not explicitly for the use of veterans, but for all very low income rural families. Grants are available for households where individuals are over the age of 65 and loans are avail available for any low income rural household. Like most USDA programs, unfortunately, the 504 program has seen significant cuts since 2009. And in fact, since 2009, the loan program has declined by 71%. And the grant program, which again is available for individuals 65 and older, has seen a decline of 7%. So beyond housing, other programs and resources also exist for veterans. And for the purposes of time, I'm not going to go over, go over these in as much detail. But I have a list of some other programs and resources here available for you to see. Uh, first of all, the VA has a directory of the different facilities that they offer. Um, this includes the Veterans Health Administration, VA Medical Centers, Veterans Integrated Service Networks, Veterans Benefit administration offices, and so on. And you can find those at their website, va.gov slash directory slash guide. Another good resource is the National Call Center for Homeless Veterans at 1-877-4-AID-VET. And the National Call Center will provide referral services and can help homeless or at risk of homeless individuals and veterans connect to the services that they need. So that will help you. Uh, or that will help a veteran get in touch with the programs and the uh, local context that they need to in order to receive the services that will help them either stay housed or help them find housing. 
The Department of Labor, through their Veterans Employment and Training Services, also offers a significant amount of programs aimed specifically at veterans. And these are programs for homeless, and homeless veterans, transition veterans, so those returning from service. Uh, they have programs specifically for incarcerated veterans who are coming out of the prison system and so on. So there's a variety of different uh, work readiness programs and vocational training programs that they have offered. Um, again, you can find those at their website, dol.gov slash vets. And then the Department of Transportation also has a couple of programs, the Veterans Transportation Service and the Veterans Transportation and Community Living Initiative. Uh, and both of these are service coordination projects which will help connect that to different transportation services, especially transportation services offered through different veteran service organizations. I should also note at this point that HACC is currently completing a veterans resource guide that will highlight a variety of these programs uh, that are available for veterans. So keep your eyes out for that. We're still working on it, but it, it should be out uh, sometime in the near future. So after all of that information, and before I move on to the question and answer session of, of the presentation, I want us to return to this, this question that we began with, with what will be the biggest challenge for housing veterans in rural America in the coming years. And so again, based on your personal experience and now from what you've heard on this presentation today, I'd be interested to see at this point what you think the biggest challenge will be. Has that changed? Is it the same as when you answered the first time? Uh, Feel free to answer this poll. It will be really interesting to discuss um, once, we, once we get these responses in. All right. So it looks like we have a similar winner, again, uh, ensuring veterans receive supports they need in rural areas where delivery may be more complicated. Um, I, so the, the top one we have is, is the poll that we took the first round. So it looks like that number has gone up um, a little bit to 62.9. But we can also see that. 29.6 uh, feel that it's the lack of economic opportunities for veterans in rural area. Um, and we have 7.4% with the changing demographics of rural veterans. So it's interesting to see. And, and I agree, I think, within rural areas, one of the hardest things is figuring out how to take, um, how to deliver services in a way that's most effective and applicable to the residents that live therein. Um, so anyway, I think it, it, it's just good to reflect back on this question after the presentation. Again, I thank you guys for taking the time out to, to answer that question. Um, and so with that, I'm going to open it up to the Q&A session or any other kind of discussion that, that we'd like to have. Um, Eric, before we go to the open session where all of the lines are unmuted, we do have a few questions that came in via chat during the presentation, and we'd like to take those first. So are you ready for those? Yep. All right, so the first question is, why is it such a low percentage of HUD bash in rural areas? Is there a specific reason? Um, 
a big part of it is it's just as I kind of mentioned before, it's harder to target funds to homeless individuals in rural areas. And with the Obama, the Obama administration's push to get rid of veteran homelessness by, I believe it was 2015, I think it was just low-hanging fruit started in the cities. It was easier to target the funding there because it was easier to find who the homeless veterans were. There were more um, homeless services that were available to kind of to combine um, and to help refer to that program. So I think that was a big part of it. We we gave a presentation similar to this uh, to the VA not that long ago, and one of the things that they had mentioned was was that they were cognizant of that kind of disconnect that exists, and they're getting to the point where they're starting to think really strategically about how they can take HUD bash and work with it within the rural context without having to necessarily uh, force individuals to leave you know, their home communities or to be closer to VA facilities. So I think a lot of it is just that it was easier to start the program off in urban areas, um, but it's something at least that they, they have acknowledged at the VA and that they're hoping to address. All right, thank you. Um, there's a second question. Is it possible to use USDA and VA grants and loans together for a particular veteran or house? Um, I'm not fully positive. I, I don't see why not. I know that there isn't a lot of, at this point, interaction with the VA and other programs. There's not a lot of um, collaboration that exists. So I, I'm guessing you mean maybe using like two different home modification programs. Um, I, I'm not positive, but I'm, I, I think that you can. But I think that it has to be made explicit that that's happening, um, which might make it harder to get both funding. If you, know, if you already have VA funding, it might be harder to secure the USDA funding. But again, I'm not, I'm not positive. All right, so Janice, um, our senior housing coordinator, is chatting in that, yes, they can be used together. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Janice. Um, another question, um, can a nonprofit apply for VA modification grants to support veterans? And there were um, in the chat section about that, Eric, so they think. Yeah. It has to be, the veteran has to apply through the VA specifically, um, but organizations can help with the modifications, but the application has to come from the veteran specifically. All right. Um, where would you refer homeless veterans to, or where do we refer homeless veterans? I think one of the best things, uh, or one of the, the best approaches to do so is, I mean, it, it's always challenging because it depends upon how aware that veteran is of the different services that exist and the different benefits that are out there for them. So I think one of the best things to do first is just to make sure that they are in contact with uh, their local VA, be it the VA Medical Center or even the Benefits Administration, uh, just so they're able to talk to someone there to see what, what um, is available. I know it can be hard, especially for nonprofits in rural areas, to access HUD VASH because they, they only have X amount of vouchers that they give out, and they have a very complicated system of how they go about doing that. And as I mentioned before, they're kind of focusing on urban areas still. Um, so it can be harder specifically to, to provide the HUD VASH vouchers. But uh, I, again, I think making sure that they're in touch with uh, a local representative from the VA um, is a really good way to start. And if it's someone who is at the point where they no longer have their home or they're very close to reaching homelessness, calling that National Call Center for Homeless Veterans is also a really good resource, and they can put you in touch with the people that can help. And again, that number is um, one eight seven seven four aid vet so 4-A-I-D-V-E-T. All right, um, next question. In terms of your perspective, what would be helpful for SSVF grantees serving in rural areas to do to meet the need?
um, to meet the need of of the homeless population they're in, or? Um, let's see. Ed, Ed, the question was from Adrian. So Adrian, to meet the need of the homeless oh, yeah. population, yes. Yeah. Um, I think one of the challenges, as I mentioned, and it might, you know, it varies from place to place, but overall in rural areas, one of the challenges is just in order to use the funding, it has to be a family that's either at risk of, home, of literal homelessness or actually already literally homeless, um, which isn't always the case with rural homeless populations. Um, so I think that, you know, from what I've seen, that adds a challenge in meeting the actual need. Uh, since they're not always eligible to receive those programs. And so from that perspective, I, I think one of the most important things to do is make sure that there's advocacy along that line to say um, rural homelessness operates differently and for this program to actually meet the population that we have, we need the definition of eligibility to change so that it, that it affects our individuals. So I think that's one of the most important things Um, and I know right now uh, the VA, I, I believe um, the comment period ends, it either ended yesterday or it ends tomorrow, but they're looking into changing the definition. Uh, and so I know Hack has commented about the fact that, that what they have currently might be restrictive to rural areas. Okay. Um, oh, they're due, yeah, 623. Thanks, Adrian. All right. Um, do the numbers in your report include individuals who are currently active service members? And what impact will those individuals have on this data once they leave the military? Yeah, so based upon the way we, we did, we got all of our numbers from um, predominantly from the American Community Survey. And the way they collect the data is that it has to be a veteran um, at that point. So it doesn't include individuals who are actively in the uh, military right now. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you know, there is a significant plurality of veterans who served during the Vietnam era, and I think it was just, you know, 6.7% um, of veterans were between the ages of, of 18 and 34. And so that, that number will continue to grow as, as more people and their military service as the wars that are happening overseas wind down. Um, so that will have an interesting impact. And as I, as I mentioned before, veteran, younger veterans are much more diverse, and there is a much uh, more significant female population within that group. And so the programs that are available to veterans will change, and will have different implications. Beyond that, uh, just as warfare changes throughout the, throughout the ages, um, you know, the, a lot of the concerns and issues that veterans coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan are different from uh, what was happening in Vietnam. We have a lot more people who have lost different limbs uh, and so on. So there's going to be a different level of, of need that exists. Beyond that, too, we know a lot more about different psychological traumas like PTSD, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, and so on. And so I think making sure that we're able to offer those services is going to be really important. And it's easy, especially in rural America, where there's such a large percentage of senior veterans that exist. I think it might be easy to overlook those coming back since they comprise such a smaller portion, especially when it comes to VA medical centers and so on. But I think it's going to be really important as these numbers continue changing as younger veterans return home that, that um, their needs are not forgotten and that, that they are met as well. All right. Um, what factors make veterans more vulnerable to homelessness than their non-vet cohort? Is it simply a matter of employment, or are there some psychological or social issues? A lot of times there are uh, psychological issues that are involved um, within that. A lot of times veterans come back from service, um, and they might have either PTSD, as I mentioned before, or some kind of service-related injury that makes it harder to find a job or that makes it harder to remain functioning in that job. Uh, sometimes veterans come back and, you know, living within a city and dealing with kind of the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle might be too much for them after what they've experienced, so that adds to it. A lot of times, too, um, 
there are a lot of issues with substance use disorders, um, especially for people struggling to deal with some of the mental health issues that exist. And again, too, there's a lot of uh, issues with employment, especially with younger generations who are coming back where, and especially in rural areas, where there just might not be jobs that are, um, that would be relevant for someone with a military background. They might find that they don't necessarily have this, or that the jobs that, that are available don't necessarily align with the skills that they have. So that's, that can be um, troubling as well. And again, that's why some of those programs at the Department of of labor offers, which aren't always that highly publicized, can be really helpful, especially for vocational training and helping veterans get in touch uh, with different employers to find um, employment opportunities. So there's, I mean, there's a large, a large range of issues, but um, I think, especially with with the older uh, veteran homeless population, a lot of it has to do with um, mental uh, health that that stemmed from their time at service. All right. Um, is there any other collaboration between federal agencies along the lines of HUD FASH program? There are not. Um, there really aren't that many, to be honest. It is a. It's still pretty siloed when it comes to a lot of the veterans programs. Um, but again, as I, I mentioned, we've had that meeting with uh, the VA not that long ago, and there does seem to be at least an acknowledgement that that siloing exists and that it might not be beneficial to um, remain operating in that sense. So I think that there, there's going to be a push to try to have more collaboration, a push to kind of look at different programs and see how they could go together. But beyond that, too, and this kind of goes back to some of the issues with hud Bash even, there's a bigger push to start looking at different community uh, service providers, so either health providers or even housing providers to see how they can work with uh, larger federal agencies. So there could be collaboration on that level as well. All right. Um, next question. Could, could rural vets use community-based medical facilities if distances to VA medical facilities are too far? So that's, a, that's actually something that is currently um, being discussed, a lot of um, service providers who I've talked to who are in rural areas bring that up a lot and say, you know, we have case managers. They might not be at a VA facility, but we have people who could fulfill these roles. They're just not affiliated with the VA. Why couldn't they potentially step in with that role? And I think that especially as the VA starts focusing more on rural homelessness with the hud -Vash program, I think that might be a direction that they're at least going to pay attention to and look into. I think it, it might make it hard um, to make sure that everyone has the proper qualifications that align specifically with what the VA requires, but um, there is at least discussion of that, and I think that that could potentially be a really good way to address some of these issues with the programs and of how they relate to rural areas. All right, um, next question. Have you done any research specifically on issues pertaining to female veterans? Um, we looked a little bit into differences between the genders uh, in regard to veterans um, within the report. Uh, what we found was, especially um, with VA medical centers, I came across a bunch of studies that have been done that showed that there is a little more resistance to access some of those, um, that female veterans are less likely to uh, take advantage of all of the benefits, especially when it comes to some of the health programs that exist for uh, a variety of reasons. Um, so we did come across that. We also found that uh, rural areas typically have less female veterans uh, per capita than either suburban and exurban areas or urban areas. And actually, uh, suburban areas have the highest female veteran population per capita. So. It's hard to say whether uh, female veterans, where they began, if they came from rural areas and then moved to suburban areas, or if suburban areas just provide a larger number of, of females that enter military service than rural areas do. But um, we found a couple of little things like that. But we haven't done anything um, too in depth on the differences between gen uh, the genders. 
All right, um, last written question. Um, have you done any research specifically on issues pertaining to veterans in tribal lands? Uh, we, again, in the report, we, we kind of broached it a little bit. Um, nothing, we haven't done anything that in depth. And in fact, it's actually, it's pretty hard to extract those numbers from uh, census data. It's, since tribal lands operate in such different ways, um, it can be complicated to, to figure out a way to extract those numbers of, of what the actual veteran population within uh, tribal areas is. And, and beyond that, a lot of times tribal areas typically see very low uh, census response rates. So the accuracy of that data is always somewhat uh, harder to verify than it would be in other areas. But um, as I mentioned, we do know that within uh, veteran homeless populations, Native Americans are typically uh, overrepresented. And in a study that we did um, a couple of years ago, uh, where we looked at homelessness on um, Native American lands, we found, I think it was in uh, Minnesota, that a, a significant amount of individuals within different tribal lands in Minnesota uh, who were homeless were actually veterans, so much much higher overrepresentation than, than uh, veterans elsewhere. All right, um, Eric, that's it for the, the, the written questions. I have actually gone ahead and chatted out your contact information, your email, and your phone number there in the chat box. Um, at this point, I am going to go ahead and unmute all the lines so that if anyone has a verbal question they'd like to ask Eric at this time, you can do so. But please, um, if you would, because we have so many people on the line, I'm going to ask you to mute your lines locally if you're not uh, planning to ask a question so that we eliminate the feedback and that we're able to hear um, all the questions and responses that might be coming in. So Eric, would you like to say anything before I unmute all the lines? Uh, no, just, uh, in, I know we're coming up to 3 o'clock here, so if any of you need to step off, I just wanted to again point to uh, the last slide we have up. The report from Service to Shelter is available online at the web address you see there. Um, we would love it if you guys took a look at it and, and gave it a read through. but. Um, Yep, I think that's all I got. All right, thank you very much. All right, and so the lines are open. If anyone wants to ask a verbal question, please do so at this time. All right, Eric, we're going to give them maybe another minute or so to think about their question um, before we close it out. Great. Any last burning questions before we end today? All right, so we are at the top of the hour. Um, I'd like to thank you once again. Hello. Hello. Yes. Oh, hi. This is um, Babette Payton with the Young Entrepreneurs of the Universe Veteran, and Ini Veteran Initiatives. Hello, Babette. Hi. <laughs> Just trying to figure out how to do all this stuff. Well, first I want to thank you for having this um, conference. And um, I'll get better as time goes on on how to use this technology. Uh, but what I'm, I'm interested in is that uh, in developing an all-green, all-accessible uh, uh, housing and economic comp campus where veterans can not only live there, but they can have their businesses there and walk to work. Does anybody know anything about that or any resources to help with something like that? I, I can't think of anything. Um, right offhand. Sorry, what? No, I was saying you couldn't think of anything right offhand? Yeah, no, I, I haven't come across anything that, that would um, be applicable for that. Well, what about if, if they could think of any resources that would be available for something like this, a prototype like this in the rural area? 
Uh, most uh, most of what we've seen is housing. So I know I, there are um, some of the programs that we talked about earlier uh, that mm -hmm. could potentially be used. But for the most part, with a lot of the VA housing um, programs that they offer, it's kind of uh, veteran specific. So it's usually a veteran applies, and then it's it's applicable to their house. I know. Um, you could potentially look into some of the, the funding that comes out of either HUD or USDA that might be a little more uh, flexible for a program like that. But again, I, I can't think of anything specifically oriented at, at veterans for something like okay. that. Okay, because like our, when our veteran campus is going to be a little, a little bit more expansive, like the, like the rental property and some of the housing property will be veteran only, but then the ones where we like want to have like four, two to four units, uh, they'll be able to have non-veterans also to live in those units. Um, if, the vet, yeah. um, can, you might use um, USDA community facilities, but can I encourage you to have this conversation offline? Uh, afterwards, Sorry. okay, yeah, because it's so specific, yeah, okay. Right, since it's so specific, so thank you very much for your question. But thank you so much for so much for the program. Look forward to keeping me in the loop on anything else you got going on. All right, great, thank you. Any okay, other questions you. out there? All right, so we are at 3.03, um, just over a little bit from 3 o'clock. And so we want to thank everyone for joining us today. We also want to, again, thank the Home Depot Foundation for their support for this webinar. Thank you, Home Depot, <laughs> from the veterans. Uh, Eric, any closing words, please? Uh, no, I just want to give a big, again, thank you to Home Depot, and also uh, just thanks for everyone for attending today. I know it was a lot of numbers and a lot of data at first, so I appreciate you sticking through uh, the whole time. and. Again, thanks for attending today. Thank you, Erin. God bless. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great okay. afternoon. Thank you, too. Okay, bye-bye. God bless.